Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I just interrupted Ray, and he was talking about the CIA and art. And so, Ray, go ahead and reiterate or say whatever you were going to say before I interrupted you. Uh, oh, just that uh, uh, the traditions in in painting had accumulated lots of knowledge uh, uh, for, from the time of Michelangelo and uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, the uh, older, older so-called classical paintings, uh, they had been uh, learning actual physical principles about uh, light and geometry and, and uh, teaching their art students uh, 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 sort of an aspect of physics to use in representing the world. And then uh, the First World War uh, uh, the uh, Dada surrealist reaction and Freudianism uh, 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 re rejected uh, the whole uh, uh, so-called rational system that uh, created uh, such terrible things uh, as the World War. Uh, and uh, that went with uh, a lot of experimentation in both the arts and, and sciences and humanities uh, trying out different things. Uh, and uh, Hitler uh, uh, closed, closed all of the experimental uh, art schools and descending uh, science uh, programs and such. Uh, but uh, right during, during and after the, uh, the Second World War, uh, the CIA created uh, the thing they called uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom, uh, in which uh, they imposed that revolutionary uh, 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 attitude towards painting, uh, destroying uh, the old because uh, of its uh, connection to the corrupt uh, uh, system. Uh, but they uh, put it out as the the, the glory of Western culture, cultural freedom. And uh, uh, Siqueiros, the Mexican painter, uh, called it ghost art, uh, <laughs> imposed by uh, the Rockefellers to destroy consciousness, uh, abstract expressionism, uh, for example, uh, all of the uh, abstract uh, uh, approaches to art and the uh, activities of the CIA through the Cultural uh, uh, Freedom Foundation uh, shamed and uh, expelled from the universities the traditional uh, uh, people who preserved uh, the uh, great tradition in painting uh, uh, so that a whole generation of painters in the universities didn't learn how to paint at all uh, and uh, we're uh, just now beginning to come out of that that phase where uh, the whole culture was uh, deliberately being destroyed and rerouted down the Rockefeller ghost art route to to destroy actual understanding. Uh, I see Noam Chomsky's uh, linguistics, so-called, as being uh, uh, one of the most powerful uh, uh, examples of that. Uh, uh, real linguistics had developed with Franz Boas and his students, uh, and uh, they had uh, uh, created descriptions, uh, understanding of a great variety of language and, uh, language and, and culture uh, that uh, what sort of a, a peak idea was uh, the Forfian hypothesis uh, showing the uh, a absolute interaction between uh, uh, conceptual understanding of the world and how the language is structured. Uh, and uh, that was a way uh, understanding the role of language behind science and art and culture 
uh, the way that uh, language uh, can propagandistically destroy uh, understanding of reality. Uh, that was part of the, uh, uh, the real tradition of linguistics. Uh, at MIT, with, with Pentagon funding, uh, the trend uh, under uh, Noam Chomsky was to throw out everything that was real in the linguistics tradition and uh, substitute a, a mysticism-based uh, view of consciousness uh, in which words uh, are essentially uh, determined by genes. It's a long story that uh, was uh, many uh, historians of language have looked back on it and uh, pointed out that his so-called generative uh, linguistics, generative uh, uh, grammar, couldn't generate anything uh, and wasn't a grammar. It was a total fraud, but uh, school textbooks, uh, high school books, uh, uh, incorporated his ideas, uh, supposedly, since it described language production in terms of a language apparatus, which is genetically determined, uh, supposedly, learning his uh, so-called linguistics would make it easier to uh, understand uh, the English language or whatever language you're studying. Uh, and they actually sold those books to school boards across the country. A absolutely uh, destructive, not only useless, but uh, destroying a consciousness of how language really works. Uh, so uh, when when he got famous for his anti-imperialism, uh, the, the world just sort of politely forgot <laughs> how fraudulent his linguistics uh, work had been. Do you think that but, he... um, uh, uh, fraudulent in the direction of opening uh, the philosophical uh, uh, world to to accept whatever the uh, uh, Pentagon and CIA? Uh, wanted to uh, substitute for consciousness. Do you suspect he was working under the direction of, of anybody specific? Um, uh, no, I, I think he was uh, one, one of the originators, uh, having grown up uh, studying uh, mysticism. Uh, it blended right into, uh, I, I think he believed in that uh, uh, mystical idea uh, that there is no consciousness other than words, uh, which in, in a fairly recent uh, video, he was explaining that, that uh, dogs can't think, uh, animals can't think because they don't have words. But he said, uh, the, the, the uh, I forget, a canine or dog, he spelled out, he, he said, if they heard uh, me say dogs, uh, they, they would... Uh, got excited and think we were going somewhere. So he was saying dogs don't have consciousness because they don't have words, but uh, then he had to uh, spell out the word because he didn't want to uh, <laughs> get the dogs excited. Are you going to say something, Georgie? Oh, Georgie, your audio. I think you're muted, Georgie. Uh, sorry, oh, no. can you hear me now? Yeah, now you're good. Okay. Yeah. So uh, weren't the experiments in North Carolina with deaf and mute people that uh, the state thought they were, uh, you know, I guess using no uh, Chomsky's theory, they thought that these were complete cretins that had like no consciousness, uh, no feelings, no mind, uh, and they were they actually forcibly sterilized them. And then later on, somebody did IQ tests on those people and, and turned out that they're perfectly intelligent. Um, so doesn't that invalidate Chomsky's theory directly? Uh, how how was his theory connected because of their speech? Yeah, exactly. So 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 they. I mean, these people had no language, right? They were born deaf and mute, and oh, and oh, all yeah. they could do basically is like. I mean, they had sign language, which eventually they learned, but initially uh, they had no language, and all they had is perception and visual perception and and tactile perception. 
And when um, when uh, um, psych psychiatrists did IQ tests on them, turned out that these some of them were like slightly behind, but most of them had normal intelligence. So it's difficult to argue yeah. that Chomsky was right because this directly proves even in humans, uh, people with no language are perfectly capable of uh, conscious experience. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, everything in reality uh, falsifies Chomsky. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this guy still a tenure professor at MIT then? Is it just inertia? Uh, uh, well, uh, at the same time, he was uh, creating his anti-linguistics, anti-science uh, doctrine of, of uh, generative uh, grammar. Uh, one of his students said that even though uh, the press uh, all through the U.S. was saying uh, Chomsky has explained how the brain creates uh, uh, language. Uh, he, uh, uh, in person, said when he says generate, he means it in the mathematical sense of account for. Uh, he uh, w was knowing that the people were being misled, that he was aware that it wouldn't actually generate anything that, that was useful, useless for that purpose. But at the same time he was doing that, Norbert Wiener, with, with his uh, more holistic approach to cybernetics, uh, uh, non-digital, non uh, analog approach, he was uh, present at, at MIT, but uh, because he criticized war, uh, wouldn't take money from the Pentagon, he was ostracized. Uh, uh, Chomsky uh, was glad to receive funding from the Pentagon. Uh, had uh, he uh, uh, was a supporter of, of a Pentagon uh, rocket. Uh, man uh, to be uh, 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 the ch chancellor of uh, uh, MIT, uh, uh, very uh, close to the Pentagon powers and, and taking their money uh, uh, and uh, uh, being, uh, in a way, the pet, Pentagon's pet uh, anti-imperialist. Um, Chomsky was, was, used to be a, a, a close associate, if not even a friend, of Marvin Minsky, one of the creators of the AI movement. And uh, I think where uh, Minsky greatly disagreed with Chomsky's theory that language is genetically determined because Minsky said, listen, if that's the case, we should have been able by now to create an algorithm that would allow a computer to generate and learn a language de novo. And we miserably okay. failed every time we tried. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, Chomsky led the public to believe he had. But uh, I, a couple of times uh, when I was teaching linguistics, uh, uh, nationally uh, known linguists would go around uh, basically propagandizing. Uh, and uh, when, when they would come to my class to talk, I would have a chance to uh, explain what was wrong with uh, uh, Chomsky's uh, thing I, I pointed out that uh, you, you can uh, create a, a sentence if you uh, pick out the, the right system, uh, right series of his rules. You can create a, a language, a sentence in any language in the world, but only if you know what the sentence is you want to produce to know what series to choose your rules in. You can't make a sentence that you don't know already applying his rules. The choice of the rules it has to be guided by the finished sentence. And a couple of them actually understood the concept. You can see that they only took them a couple of minutes to forget it. In one of your articles, you said that the real structure of language is images, based on images. Um, so if I understand this correctly, language comes after perception, just like anything else in this world. So if language is based on images, is the fundamental structure of language based in physical brain structure, which always changes with time and experience? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the brain structure 
structure as formed by interaction with the world. So in other words, m metabolic uh, uh, rate, which greatly influences changes in brain structure, it may be the ultimate determinant in the evolution of language. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you can uh, analyze language. Uh, someone uh, looked at letters that nuns had written in their 20s, uh, and then they knew their, the outcome, uh, and those who developed uh, Alzheimer's at a relatively young age, uh, they could see that their language structure in their 20s uh, was <laughs> simplified uh, and uh, the, the uh, at a young age with a lot of mental energy, uh, the uh, language structure is extremely complex and unique. Every situation uh, demands a fundamental rethinking of the whole thing. And so there is real uniqueness in everything a healthy person says. And uh, when the mental energy is lower, what you get is uh, strings of cliches. So basically the ability to, to turn um, experiences into language depends on, depends on the metabolic rate uh, vitally. Yeah. And the summation of that is uh, Chomsky was too addicted to the MIT Epstein money to change his ways. <laughs> uh, to change his what? His change his ways, change his theories. He was too committed to them. I'm I'm just joking. But didn't uh, didn't uh, Epstein uh, work at MIT? Uh, uh, oh, uh, not that I heard of. Oh, oh yeah, uh, late, uh, le uh, just a little while before he was. Uh, no notorious, uh, he he was uh, uh, fun funding uh, one of their programs, uh, and the guy who uh, accepted his funding uh, was embarrassed and quit. Well, I think there, him and Minsky collaborated on a, on a few things, or or uh, uh, at least Epstein uh, sponsored some of Minsky's research. Um, mm -hmm. At least that's that's what I saw recently on the uh, global research site and. Uh, some of the other more peripheral ones, which seem to be speaking more more truth than mainstream media has c cumulatively done over the century. Well, speaking of that, so I, obviously we'll talk about all those things. Um, but first, I wanted to chat about Ray's newsletter, and then we could kind of go off the deep end on all the coronavirus stuff. And so, Ray, you just sent out your Ray Pete's newsletter, Estrogen, Iron, Degenerative Aging, and Progesterone. And I, again, it's insane to me that you're good. I was going to say, I, I thought you were putting together new parts of the puzzle, and I thought it was just amazing that you're still synthesizing these new ideas all every two months, you know, so I, I thought it was a fantastic newsletter. What what was your motivation behind writing it? I, I'm just noticing that people weren't putting two and two together <laughs> over the years, <laughs> stuff that people could have been uh, actually doing serious work on 50 years ago. Uh, uh, no one really has the motivation or energy to draw the conclusions. And uh, I thought... Uh, and uh, incidentally, the, some people probably still don't have their uh, copy of it because uh, uh, the Gmail is... Uh, uh, limiting it to uh, uh, a certain num number every 24 hours. Uh, and so I think about half of them still haven't gone through. B Bummer. If you need any help with that, uh, l let us know, obviously. But uh, what, what were some of the major points? Like, y you're obviously uh, conversing with the public all the time. You know, what are the huge misconceptions that you feel like this newsletter covered that are just repeated over and over that you think are incorrect? Um, that uh, working on uh, one part of it, like taking a, an aromatase inhibitor, uh, isn't going to uh, solve very much. Uh, uh, and at the same time, it's imp improving one thing. It is likely to be making something else worse. Uh, and so to uh, uh, look at the whole whole process as far as you can. 
uh, and uh, th think of uh, how, how you can remedy uh, things w with the least uh, risk of doing more damage. I have a question in one of the uh, main themes that you have there, which says that uh, osteoporosis and dementia are associated with um, iron overload, but they're also associated with an increased likelihood of anemia. So what would be your what would be your understanding of anemia? Just low ferritin and low iron saturation? Uh, uh, no, no anemia, uh, low blood, uh, low hematocrit and low hemoglobin. Uh, and uh, about 50 years ago, someone uh, was studying the health of California migrant workers uh, and found that uh, the, the, the kids uh, running around uh, somewhat hungry and dirty uh, uh, were healthier than uh, the uh, local uh, middle class uh, 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 Anglo kids. Uh, and uh, the, one of their features, uh, the, the uh, 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 immigrant, uh, very poor kids had, I think, a hemoglobin of 10 uh, or ten and a half, something like that, uh, and it, it isn't just uh, uh, malaria in Africa uh, that uh, uh, flares up uh, and kills people when they uh, give them an iron supplement, but uh, uh, right in the U.S., uh, they can see that uh, so-called anemic kids are healthier uh, than the ones with uh, the so-called normal uh, levels of hematocrit and hemoglobin. So by our iron overload, you mean the accumulation of uh, unusable iron in the forms of lipofusking and uh, other iron iron complexes? Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, estrogen is one of the things that, that causes you to uh, retain uh, iron, uh, but... Uh, protectively lowers your uh, uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit. Uh, and uh, for, for 100 years, uh, doctors have uh, looked at uh, the uh, women, uh, sometimes with very low uh, hematocrit or hemoglobin, uh, and prescribed uh, iron pills uh, and kept prescribing it even if their uh, hemoglobin got lower, uh, not understanding uh, that uh, the same thing that uh, makes them overload on iron uh, is uh, uh, blocking their bone marrow uh, formation of red blood cells. So the well-known pro, uh, like the well-known effects of increasing hemo he hematocrit and hemoglobin under the effect of androgens is that due to the op the opposition of androgens to uh, to estrogen or a direct yeah. effect of androgens? Both direct, uh, direct on the uh, uh, bone marrow in particular uh, uh, stabilizes it uh, and uh, uh, helps it uh, uh, get, get warmer, more productive. Uh, estrogen tends to lower the temperature, uh, and that goes, uh, um, uh, among other things, uh, with a tendency to inflammation uh, and uh, uh, iron toxicity. Have you seen those studies that claim that the purpose, apparently, of fever is to deplete serum iron and tryptophan, which helps greatly in fighting off an, inf uh, an infection? Uh, uh, yeah, and it reduces uh, uh, all sorts of cytokines. Uh, 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 chilling uh, creates inflammation, secreting inflammatory cytokines. Uh, and uh, causes cells to take up water, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the falling temperature is uh, uh, not only a sign of, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, it's one of the mechanisms by which estrogen changes the, the body physiology. Well, uh, can you run through the calcium metabolism and how that leads to the accumulation of iron? Like what does, what does parathyroid hormone have to do with uh, uh, iron overload? The, the way uh, parathyroid works, uh, it, it, for, for example, 
uh, under stimulation uh, of the uh, renin uh, uh, angiotensin uh, uh, aldosterone system. Uh, that, that system uh, activates the parathyroid hormone, ser serotonin, uh, 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 pro-inflammatory, uh, activates the uh, parathyroid to uh, provide uh, uh, more calcium uh, to, to the bloodstream uh, uh, by taking it out of the bone. Uh, and the, the way it takes it out of the bone is to suppress the formation uh, of carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide helps uh, uh, the present uh, calcium to crystallize uh, into the bone uh, as uh, calcium uh, carbonate. Uh, and uh, when the CO2 production is lowered, it's uh, uh, re replaced by uh, glycolytic production uh, of lactic acid, uh, and the lactic acid uh, uh, it in itself help, helps to dissolve uh, the, the bone. Uh, the pH uh, isn't the thing because uh, you can have a low pH with CO2 forming bone and the same pH with lactic acid uh, d disassembling the bone. Uh, and in all the rest of your tissues, uh, including the cells in your bone making the lactic acid, uh, all of the uh, intracellular uh, processes, uh, uh, blood vessels in, in particular suffer uh, uh, when they shift from producing carbon dioxide to producing lactate, the intracellular pH rises, uh, increasing the negative uh, ionization uh, of the cell proteins, uh, 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 increasing uh, their affinity uh, for uh, metals uh, with a positive charge. Uh, 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 ionized calcium with two positive charges, uh, uh, iron, uh, aluminum, lead, uh, any other metal that is present uh, will uh, be stuck inside your uh, soft tissue cells uh, along with the calcium, uh, especially if the calcium is deficient in your diet. Uh, you will be taking up more iron aluminum, uh, lead, uh, whatever is uh, present in your intestine. Uh, so the, the the more calcium deficient you are, uh, the more parathyroid hormone you make, uh, and uh, the uh, more uh, other metals will be present uh, under the influence of parathyroid hormone to crystallize uh, poisoning your uh, blood vessels and brain cells and kidney cells in particular. In Gilbert Link's theory, potassium, which is another alkali mineral, has the highest affinity for the intracellular proteins. How are these other metals such as sodium, calcium, and iron able to displace potassium and, and uh, disrupt the structure that, that, that potassium forms in the proteins? Um, the uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, causes uh, it, its uh, affinity for electrons uh, as an acidic uh, Lewis uh, acid uh, uh, molecule. Uh, as it associates with the proteins, uh, the electrons are retracted, uh, making the uh, uh, electron uh, cloud uh, uh, holding the uh, potassium uh, proton holding the potassium uh, uh, alternatively with protons, uh, 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 making it uh, uh, experience in a, a lower uh, attractive uh, uh, concentration of electrons. Uh, and uh, since the uh, water polarization of the big uh, potassium uh, atom uh, it doesn't uh, interfere with that lower uh, electronic uh, attractive field. The potassium uh, is strongly attracted even to a, 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 
uh, an electron retracted protein. But uh, as the uh, carbon dioxide is decreased uh, and the uh, pH rises under the influence of uh, forming lactic acid, uh, then the electron cl cloud on the protein uh, is uh, no longer retracted towards the CO2, uh, but uh, oh. it uh, for forms a more intense uh, concentration of negative charge, uh, which uh, will overcome the highly polarized uh, 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 water layers around uh, sodium, for example, uh, but uh, also around uh, uh, other highly concentrated uh, uh, positive charges. Uh, when, once the uh, sodium uh, 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 starts displacing the uh, uh, potassium, uh, uh, then the, pota the calcium and uh, lead uh, 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 Mercury and, and uh, iron will have a chance to get in at the same time as the calcium. So you're saying that the during the production of uh, during the elevation of lactic acid production, intracellular pH rises, but that's because the cell quickly expels the lactic acid it produces, right? That's what that's yeah. what raising the pH. Because if the lactic acid stays inside, the pH will drop and the cell will probably die. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the lactic acid quickly moves out of the cell and acidifies the environment, uh, uh, creating uh, uh, other problems, activating uh, inflammatory signals and so on. Uh, but what, what happens inside uh, when the uh, lactic acid leaves uh, is uh, uh, an increased pH because of the, uh, the way the NADH handles its uh, protons. Does lactic acid increase the reactivity of iron? I don't recall <laughs> how, how they interact directly. Okay, so so iron basically by being in the body, if there are a lot of reactive oxygen species, they're the ones that turn iron into the reactive form, which is the ferrous iron, and that's what attacks the polyunsaturated fats. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, the, the CO2 uh, is known to have a, an inactivating effect on uh, iron, uh, uh, helping to uh, keep, keep it in a relatively oxidized uh, state because of that acid property of CO2. Uh, and just by displacing CO2, then uh, lactic acid is in effect uh, uh, likely to make iron more reactive uh, when when you reduce uh, the uh, triply uh, ionized ferric iron, uh, uh, you get the highly reactive ferrous iron. Uh, so the reducing property of, of uh, lactic acid uh, is uh, for sure going to uh, create iron damage. And in that case, the reactive oxygen species are also a problem because they also have the re this reductive effect, right? I mean, so keeping the metabolic rate high and preventing the leakage of these reactive oxygen species through the membrane, keeping their numbers low, is another thing that will like limit the activation of iron and turning it into the reactive form. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a whole flowing system that changes the nature of the cytoplasmic substance. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 it's a process that isn't just an adding uh, of a, a lot of little events, but the whole uh, the, the, the way uh, uh, Gilbert Ling saw it was that the, the nature of the substance uh, of the cell has these different uh, ways of existing. What is the direct conductor of this whole process? I mean, in some articles you mentioned thyroid and other CO2, but I guess the main effector of these beneficial changes, which keep the intracellular pH low, keep the uh, iron from getting into the reactive state, keep the electron flow going, it seems that all of this, the direct agent is carbon dioxide, but the thyroid is just a cause of the creation of carbon dioxide. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the CO2 is, is the most 
uh, pervasive uh, and powerful uh, and uh, immediate uh, uh, causer. Uh, and uh, it simultaneously goes with uh, your consciousness, uh, uh, your, your level of motivation uh, and uh, sensitivity and, and all of those things. Uh, all of the life properties uh, correspond to uh, basically the level of CO2 in your tissue. In your estimation, is parathyroid hormone one of the strongest stimulators of lactic acid production? Uh, uh, yeah, as I presently understand it. So all things being equal, if you were to be injected with estrogen or serotonin or PTH, PTH would be the worst out of all of those? I, uh, yeah, except that uh, estrogen ends up increasing your oh, PTH. Yeah. Well, well, I was talking to Kate Deering. We were trading emails back and forth, and I and we were trying to figure something out, and I realized I had... A, like a um, estrogen increases parathyroid hormone, a prolactin increases parathyroid hormone, aldosterone increase like every single thing. It, it, serotonin increases parathyroid. And so it seemed like that was, I don't know, the final common path of stress. Is is that how you look at it? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the uh, androtensin system is uh, very close to it, uh, but uh, I, I think that's the right way of seeing it. But the, the reverse is also true, isn't it? The parathyroid hormone stimulates the production of all of these other mediators <laughs> as well. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, it creates the degenerative uh, alarm condition uh, and the short-term uh, re recuperative stress hormones uh, all exacerbate the long-range uh, degenerative processes. And last question about this, I, I, I'm pretty, uh, I don't know if I caught this ever. The, P, the parathyroid hormone is stimulating the production of lactic acid from the bone specifically. Is that right? Um, uh, well, that's its functional, uh, uh, most, most known uh, uh, action, but it can't help doing it everywhere in the body. And, and then it, to do that to other tissues, it just has to be in the blood. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Awesome. So uh, what increases cellular uptake of parathyroid hormone, and what conversely, what inhibits it? Is there a mechanism that can do one or the other? Uh, one or the other, what? Uh, uh, cellular uh, uptake of parathyroid hormone. In other words, is there a way to make the cell mo more resistant to parathyroid hormone? Like, uh, I mean, I, I know the medicine talks about receptors. But uh, as you said, the, the cell is the entire receptor. The entire cell is the receptor. What makes a cell resistant to parathyroid hormone? No, nothing that I know of. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so really, the only way to protect is limit its synthesis. Uh, yeah, uh, and vitamin D and calcium and magnesium are the, the things that are best known to do that. But uh, at the same time, uh, re reducing. Uh, angiotensin and serotonin uh, and aldosterone, for example. Is there a, a specific parathyroid hormone receptor that medicine claims is the main mechanism through which th that hormone works? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, M maybe that's why. Like we, uh, there may be there may be steroids that that compete with it. Um, but we just, I guess the receptor hasn't been found, found yet, or, or at least medicine is not interested in looking at it because they, they think parathyroid hormone is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's given <laughs> to osteoporotic people to increase their bone growth. Yeah. Ray, I stole a ref I, I forgot what article you had posted this in, but it, apparently uh, parathyroid hormone is harder to suppress as you get older or sicker. And it was a Adami paper, A-D-A-M-I, relationship between a serum parathyroid hormone, vitamin D sufficiency, age, and calcium intake? I, I think it does increase with age. Uh, the, uh, one of the uh, interesting things that they, they don't like to talk about either uh, is that the bone with aging and osteoporosis uh, forms lots of aromatase, it becomes a powerful uh, source of estrogen at the same time that it's degenerating. 
And that would be ameliorated by uh, what? Just decreasing the activity of the parathyroid or, or no, this is a f functional aspect of the bone. That's not going to, not going to change or, or how do you reverse that? Uh, um, yeah, uh, getting your calcium and vitamin D uh, and magnesium high enough that you turn off your parathyroid hormone, uh, uh, that's necessarily going to reduce the, uh, the local stress and uh, all of the signals that increase aromatase. Amazing. Uh, might take a five-minute break here. We have Ray Pete on the phone, Georgie Dinkov, my partner in crime, <laughs> are you, sir? Uh, we're talking about Ray Pete's newsletter right now. The newsletter is available by email now. It's $28 U.S., which can be paid through PayPal at Ray Pete's newsletter, uh, Pete's with an S, newsletter at gmail.com. And uh, Ray is sending those out right now. You can also email Ray Pete's newsletter to purchase uh, Ray's books. I frequently come in contact with people that have no idea that you've written <laughs> any books. And so I would strongly recommend people get a hold of these. They're basically collector's items. And then, uh, Ray, why don't we talk about uh, Progest-E from Kenogen and how does progesterone relate to parathyroid hormone? Uh, um, it strengthens your bones and turns off aromatase and if once you recognize that stressed bones produce estrogen but by their local aromatase then you see one of the reasons that progesterone is going to strengthen the bones because it it knocks out it inhibits aromatase and knocks out the estrogen receptors so in addition to good nutrition and calcium and vitamin d like progesterone thyroid vitamin k would be good things for osteoporosis uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, everything good helps your bones have you uh, i have a question in one of the newsletters you said that uh, serotonin antagonists are highly anabolic for the bone and i've seen a number of different studies come out um with the uh Various drugs, one of them on Dancitron, which is prescribed for nausea, but it's really a serotonin antagonist. Um, and it seems that these agents directly, somehow directly work on the osteoclasts and osteoblasts without necessarily affecting parathyroid hormones. So it seems like serotonin has a direct effect on bone health um, that um, is, while overlapping with parathyroid hormone, there is an independent component of it too. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh... Everything really is overlapping. That the receptor idea is just a way of trying to introduce order, kind of artificially. Amazing! Thanks for that. Uh, email Catherine to purchase uh, Progest. -E. Each bottle contains thirty four hundred milligrams of progesterone. It lasts a very long time, unless you use it topically, which I'm going through bottles every month. <laughs> uh, uh, another oh, question yeah. on on progesterone. Um, in one of your articles, you mentioned that the high enough concentrations of progesterone can actually make the so-called estrogen receptor protein completely disintegrate. Um, and I've seen I've seen many studies confirming that. And other substances such as caffeine apparently have the same effect. Does progesterone has the same sort of disintegrating effect on aromatase too, or it's or is it simply inhibiting its effects? Uh, uh, I I think it's just. Uh blocking the uh, promotion. Uh, uh, for example, uh, one of the powerful promoters uh, of aromatase is prostaglandin E, uh, and uh, uh, the, the enzyme uh, cyclooxygenase uh, uh, that uh, makes prostaglandin is activated under almost exactly the same circumstances that activate aromatase. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, there's almost always uh, prostaglandin E present uh, pushing uh, uh, for, for the formation of, of estrogen. And uh, the progesterone is known to, uh, uh, in multiple overlapping ways, to uh, block the formation uh, of prostaglandin E uh, uh, by uh, uh, creating uh, uh, destructive metabolites of it, uh, blocking its its formation, uh, and uh, 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 pro probably several parallel uh, mechanisms that 
uh, prevent uh, the uh, activation, uh, uh, opposing cortisol's uh, activating effect uh, on uh, aromatase. What do you think is the main mechanism uh, behind the synthesis of the actual aromatase protein? Is it simply under the the body detects that the me metabolic rate is low, or or there a tissue and organ needs uh, you know massive amounts of repair, and that's what triggers genomically the synthesis of more aromatase, or is there another mechanism behind it like radiation, heavy metals, things like that? Uh, 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 yeah, uh, all of those things. Uh, uh... Uh, overlap uh, for more than 50 years, uh, uh, radiation, hypoxia, uh, vitamin E deficiency, uh, uh, progesterone deficiency, uh, all of these have been known to uh, activate the formation of, uh, of um, more uh, aromatase. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 uh, that's a... Uh, you, you have to uh, then uh, look at what each one of these things is doing, uh, each one of those factors, radiation, hypoxia, and so on, uh, is also activating many other parts of the, the cell, uh, which uh, lead to activation of, of aromatase. Uh, so it's uh, uh, like a holistic a switch mechanism in which everything uh, gathers up a, a, a summation of forces uh, to either turn aromatase on or off. If um, does the entry of steroids into the cell uh, depend on the steroid structure and the status, the lipophilic or hydrophilic status of the cell? For example, cortisol and estrogen much more hydrophilic than things like pregnenolone or progesterone. So if the cell is composed of fully saturated fats and is, hydri and is highly lipophilic, would that decrease the amount of uh, 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 hydrophilic steroids such as glucocorticoids and estrogen and aldosterone from entering inside the cell? Uh, uh, yeah, because at the same time, it's uh, keeping the energy state of the cell up, which uh, maintains the hydrophobic uh, condition. Uh, uh, the, uh, the stabilizing uh, of uh, the hydrophobicity is also the stabilizing of, of the energy level, uh, and that uh, suppresses uh, all of the uh, uh, things that would call for uh, raising the uh, amount of of uh, estrogen or cortisol in the blood. So a very, very well energized, highly, highly lipophilic cell would be resistant to estrogen, even though it may be expressing the the estrogen receptor, um, and and in in a basic at a normal level. So it may look like an estrogen sensitive cell, but estrogen can't really do much because it cannot get inside. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's probably keeping the estrogen receptors on the verge of disintegration to, to keep the hydrophobicity high. Is there, do you think that may account for some studies that show that if you drastically increase the intake of saturated fat in the diet, it shows an increase of the amount of estradiol in the urine and sometimes in the blood as well? Would that be simply because the body is excreting all of this estradiol that cannot be used because the cells simply are impervious to it? I, I think so. Uh, 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 a group, uh, uh, I think it's uh, generally uh, led by Pasqualini, uh, has uh, identified the uh, processes uh, of uh, increasing uh, estrogen uh, in the cell or, or decreasing it. Uh, and in about uh, 10 different ways, uh, progesterone's effect is to uh, get estrogen uh, out of the cell and inactivated, uh, made water soluble so that it uh, travels through the blood quickly and is excreted. Uh, and uh, so the deficiency of progesterone uh, will leave your cells uh, highly activated by estrogen, 
for example, uh, in the uterus or, or breast tissue that is deficient uh, in progesterone. It's internally, it begins making its own estrogen so it doesn't depend on the ovaries or adrenals to, uh, 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 you know, they used to cut those out to uh, prevent or cure breast cancer. But uh, when if you take out the uh, ovaries and adrenals, you're also taking out progesterone uh, and uh, that activates the uh, process of forming estrogen locally, uh, uh, starting with the uh, uh, uterus and breast, but eventually going to every tissue that has been studied. Since the main method of deactivating estrogen is the glucuronidation process and glucuronic acid production depends on glucose availability, would you say that increase... Uh, yeah. Sulfation. Is and sulfation, yes. Uh, would you say that, that the presence of sufficient amount of um, glucose in the diet, of carbohydrates in the diet, is, is vital for the proper excretion and deactivation of estrogen? I, yeah, I, I, think, I think so. Uh, the, uh, the glucuronic acid is related to the, the vitamin C producing system uh, and uh, uh, that requires the, the normal flow of c carbohydrate through the system. Great stuff. Before we move on, Ray, was there any other part of your newsletter that we should touch on before we move on? I, nothing occurs to me. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, I, I have a question about li lipofuscin. Um, what is the mechanism through which lipofuscin inhibits the electron transport chain? Does it bind to one of the complexes directly, such as cytochrome C oxidase, or does it simply impede the flow of electrons by its accumulation and, and I guess, repellent forces, ele electric repellent forces? Uh, my basic idea is that it's uh, consuming the, the oxygen and the electrons uh, that uh, should be available to the mitochondria uh, and it's directly turning them uh, into uh, hydrogen peroxide and superoxide uh, and water. So, but in order for that process to happen, means you, that basically the accumulation of reactive oxygen species needs to occur, which suggests that a, a block of oxidative phosphorylation is already happening, right? Uh, yeah, uh, but it, it's like an amplifier uh, once the process uh, starts, you're making uh, more heme oxygenase, releasing more uh, iron, uh, getting a more reduced environment that uh, makes the iron more toxic, uh, uh, and uh, consuming uh, oxygen, lowering oxygen ten tension, uh, 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 accelerating the process. Uh, once a person uh, in old age uh, reaches a point where they're visibly uh, de developing a massive uh, uh, accumulation of dark pigment uh, it, it is uh, uh, extremely uh, quick uh, that they will uh, go on to die. I, I was going to move on, Georgie. Stop me, though, if you have another question. No? No, I, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Ray, we were talking before this, and I, I joked, and I said, uh, how are things in the apocalypse in Oregon, and, and you said things are halfway through. And so, you know, instead of just going through the news and talking about all the bad things that are happening, I'm, of course we can't do that. But, like, can you su summarize what's going on? Like, is this the capitalist class winning and then making, like, a, a winning over the working class? Or, like, what? how can people think about what's going on in a reasonable way? Because, I mean, it's ex extremely confusing what's happening, I feel like. Uh, they, the ruling class knows uh, very well how to uh, herd uh, people, uh, uh, scare them with something, uh, uh, get a, a, a lemming conformist uh, trend going, uh, and then uh, keep keep them scared and uh, inform them that uh, everyone is going to do it, and uh, you will be a freak if you don't. Uh, go along with them. Uh, and so I think they're even uh, inflating uh, the number of people who are really uh, getting the vaccines. 
uh, the propaganda uh, has reached a point, I think, uh, that it is uh, 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 triggering the irritation, self-defense reflex in more and more people uh, who are, uh, as they start communicating, finding ways around the censorship, that frightens the ruling class more, and so they they panic and get more absurd in the lies they're putting out through the the media. Well, that like people with two vaccines becoming suddenly unvaxed because they don't have a third one. <laughs> I mean, should shake anybody to their core that this is insane. And of course, I mean, that's if I were to hypothesize, given the things I've seen, that's just to normalize constant vaccination. And, and that's part of the agenda for whatever reason. Uh, uh, yes, uh, three vaccines in a year, and uh, that's not <laughs> counting the uh, the influenza and, uh, and uh, shingles and uh, uh, chicken pox and uh, 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 all of the other vaccines. Uh, they, they, uh, they haven't uh, uh, revised anything, so it says now adults are going to need uh, uh, multiple, uh, many annual vaccinations, uh, even though the the information uh, has been coming out for several years that uh, the influenza vaccine, for example, makes you uh, much more likely, several times more likely than the unvaccinated to develop a respiratory uh, 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 pneumonia-like problem. Uh, so uh, the, there was a huge uh, uh, campaign uh, uh, the previous year, uh, uh, 2018 into 2019, to get uh, Italians uh, uh, vaccinated with the influenza. Uh, and uh, according to everything that's known, that would uh, multiply several fold uh, their risk of uh, developing some other uh, respiratory disease. Uh, so that very likely was a factor in the, the high mortality in in Italy that they had been so obedient in getting their influenza vaccine. I don't know if you checked out that notion document I sent you, but there were two tweets. One was from Marx in 1842 and another one from uh, Illich in 1976. And it seems like people were sounding the alarm on the possibility of like a medical dictatorship. And so I'm sure given the amount of things you've read, like that was pro probably a lot of people have talked about this, that it would come to kind of some kind of technocratic medical um, nightmare situation. There's a movie called V for Vendetta, which was fairly recent, which was exactly about that. I haven't seen it for years. Ray, did, did uh, I mean, you've read a lot of Illich's stuff. Was that something he was chronically talking about? Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, he, he saw education and, and medicine uh, as uh, the, the two basic evils of, of our society that uh, were destroying uh, humanity. What about technology? The Unabomber thought technology is at the <laughs> core, is the actual the direct agent. Do you agree with that, of the destruction? Uh, 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 well, yeah, the way uh, technology is uh, used uh, in indoctrination, uh, the, the existence of the technical uh, knowledge itself uh, needn't be harm, harmful, but uh, they create this ideology of uh, the uh, digital uh, view of consciousness, for example, uh, that's separate from uh, uh, technical understanding. Uh, if uh, Norbert Wiener had, had been followed, uh, uh, there there wouldn't have been uh, the, this digitized uh, reality, uh, quantization uh, of everything uh, as part of the, uh, the philosophical uh, reductionism. That reality is discrete instead of continuous. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, right. By the, the second vaccine, third vaccine and impending f- fourth vaccine, would there be something a person could measure on a lab test? Like, would there aldosterone be like through the roof or something with uh, inducing that spike protein? Would there be something they could identify? Inducing the spike protein? Uh, in, I'm not sure what you mean. Like if somebody was skeptical uh, that vac- these vaccines were harmful, could they get a blood test for something that would demonstrate like that their physiology was completely out of whack? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I, I think the uh, angiotensin would be uh, uh, pretty high. Is that an accurate blood test? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I've never, I've never had a measure. <laughs> what do you, uh, I don't know if you've seen the news, but China is embarking on a massive vaccination campaign to, uh, to vaccinate 1.1 billion people by October 1st. Um, what do you think is behind that? Is China also under control of the, or partial at least, of the powers that be? Or do they have another motive, afraid maybe that the, you know, if the this, this virus narrative falls apart, maybe CIA or, or who knows what, or who, know, who, who knows who else will release another virus and that one won't be as benign? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, China keeps in mind uh, the history of germ warfare. Uh, of the United States, uh, and uh, that's probably uh, part of their thinking. But they also collaborated with the United States in that Wuhan Institute of Virology on this gain of function research. So, is that a is that a case of keep your friends close, your enemies closer? The Chinese just wanted to get an idea of what the Americans are thinking of unleashing, or um, or do you think China is on board with the with this whole globalization plan? I think it's a faction in China. I think the, the president, uh, 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 she uh, uh, intervened and uh, uh, sort of uh, cut, cut down the Fauci faction. Oh, I see. So that may be behind the, his announcement that he's going to redistribute the wealth, make China more equitable? Uh, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to move on to questions. Georgie, stop me if you have any other. So uh, before this, Ray, I, I gathered a bunch of questions um, from people that watch this show. And so I thought we would run through them and let, let and then let you go. Uh, guys, give this episode a like. Sincerely appreciate it. We have an amazing uh, listenership that hangs out every Friday. So guys, thank you so much, Georgie. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Um, so my number, my first question here was uh, hopefully like a clarification of, of Georgie and I were talking about collecting the urine and each liter being about a thousand calories, but I think I might have, Georgie might have said it correctly, and I might have goofed it. But can you just explain that that uh, test, that at home test for collecting urine, and and how to quantify how many calories you're burning real fast? Uh, no, I don't know how, how it would be used for counting calories. What, well, didn't you mention that if you discard the morning urine? Then you collect the urine the rest of the day. Couldn't you do some kind of math and then figure out how many calories you're burning? Uh, uh, if you measure your water, total water intake uh. Uh, and urine, uh, then you know how much water you're evaporating. Right. Uh, and uh, that goes up as you burn calories. Uh, so uh, you have to know the water balance. So you basically perspire about a liter of water for every thousand calories burned, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My okay. apologies to Georgie because I butchered that and I said you were wrong last time. So my apologies, Georgie. Th- thanks for clarifying that, Ray. Uh, speaking of something else you can clarify, I have a quote from you in two th- uh, 2012 and it says, I have known, a p- uh, this is the relevant part, uh, when it's taken to small doses, 50 micrograms of T3 will usually normalize any hypothyroid metabolism. And I actually send that quote to a lot of people, and I just wanted to like bring it back up since it's nine years old and see see if you still felt similarly about that kind of upper cap of 50 micrograms of T3. Uh, that's just the equivalent of uh, the old uh, standard two grains uh, of armor. Uh, it's uh, part, partly just an arbitrary a number because it varies so much with individuals, but uh, roughly 25 micrograms of T3 uh, sums up 
uh, about the same as as one grain of armor. Uh, and since the average replacement dose used to be two grains of armor, uh, that's where that 50 micrograms come, came from. And if somebody was taking 50 micrograms, like how, the people that you know who have done that, do they take 10 micrograms five times per day with, with food, or do you split up even smaller? Or what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, either way, but for sure split up uh, so it comes in gradually. Good. Stop me at any time, Georgie. Um, okay, so no, another question from a listener here, and they said, uh, I'd like to hear from him about some of the reasons that he is so upbeat about Mexico. The ones that you mentioned, he talked about on the call that you were on with him. Uh, in fact, I'd like a whole show about Mexico, he says. So I mentioned on a live stream saying that we were on a call that I didn't set up by some other people, and and you were very positive about Mexico. And I, so I think that's on, on a lot of people's minds right now of, hey, I got to get out of the U.S. or I got to get out of somewhere else. And uh, I mentioned that you were had a very positive view of Mexico. If you want to reiterate any of that, I think uh, people would enjoy it. Uh, the the uh, objective evidence is that, uh, I guess it was about 20 years ago, Cuauhtémoc Cardenas uh, really won the popular vote uh, but uh, lost the election uh, by fraud. Uh, and the fact that uh, uh, in actual uh, uh, votes uh, as well as uh, electoral uh, success, uh, AMLO uh, had national support. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the great bulk of the population supports those two <laughs> in, individuals uh, shows uh, a lot about the quality of the country. Uh, 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 very, very different from uh, European American uh, consciousness. Do you think there are any there's any truth to the claims that there were there was election fraud in? In the last election, in the presidential election in the U.S., I mean, if this can happen in Mexico, why why couldn't it happen here? Considering the sophistication of the three-letter agencies. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the uh, use of uh, digital uh, voting machines uh, operated through computers. Uh, it's the perfect uh, way to uh, hide uh, uh, the fraud to some extent. Uh, uh, black box uh, voting. Uh, uh, when, when uh, it was pointing out uh, fraud by the Republicans uh, was a very popular website, <laughs> but uh, I think they're still in operation, but uh, no one wants uh, to investigate uh, uh, fraud by the Democrats com comparatively. You know Do you think the, the court system has been completely compromised or at least compromised to the point where even if evidence is unearthed, um, it, it will simply go nowhere? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think the courts are, are uh, well uh, well packed uh, with <laughs> state uh, supporting uh, no, no matter uh, which party. It doesn't uh, re really matter that much which fascist party uh, you're <laughs> keeping in power. Uh, Ray, before I read off more questions, is there anything you want to say about Afghanistan? And is there anything you want to say about the FDA, uh, so-called FDA uh, approval of the, the vaccines? Oh, uh, the, the, uh, I, I think uh, uh, there was a, a possible positive interpretation uh, for Biden wanting to uh, do what uh, Trump wanted to do, get, get the army out of some of the uh, wars, uh, and I, I think the uh, today's bombing uh, probably was the factions that uh, uh, can't afford to have uh, any decrease in uh, war expending uh, expenditure. Uh, the the uh, trillions uh, that have gone through the uh, military uh, uh, industry in. Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, uh, they don't want to see the, the tap turned off to their uh, endless money supply. So, so Do you, you think Biden's decision to withdraw was 
was there anything good behind it, according to you, or do you think it was more more along the lines of a political move because midterm elections are coming? He wants to please the war weary public. Uh, money can be spent at other to on other things. You know, public really doesn't want any more wars, wars right now. Uh, yeah, I, I think there that interpretation of a natural positive action by Biden uh, is reasonable, uh, but uh, the the faction that doesn't want to stop the war uh, will uh, kill lots of people to try to uh, get uh, the, the reoccupation going. Great stuff. Thanks for that. Okay, here's another one. Uh, Ray has previously mentioned that his favorite animals are ants. Are there any animals that Ray considers to be evil or malevolent, such as mosquitoes or hyenas? I, I don't think so. Uh, it, it's just what they interpret as food that doesn't uh, isn't compatible with our uh, uh, well-being. Uh, uh, I, I noticed someone who asked the question. I think uh, had the name sandwich. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, 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 it's a matter of perspective. Uh, the uh, mosquito and hyena uh, see lunch when they uh, smell a person, uh, and uh, it's just in conflict with human preferences. You have a good memory for remembering that. What uh, semi-related? Oh, oh, on that oh, yeah. note, on that note, um, then do you think this? Then uh, let's say hunting. For food, not for not for fun, not for pleasure. Hunting for food is an, is 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 not an immoral activity for a human. Um, yeah, if there's actually a, a reason to, to 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 hunt for food, if they really need food, oh. it's like a, a hyena. Uh, you can't uh, say that they're having evil thoughts just because they <laughs> have a different idea of what lunch is. That's exactly the, the context that was asking. I mean, if a person is hungry and if, let's say, food supply becomes a problem or becomes too compromised, right, um, and all you have is a gun and you're in the wilderness, then um, I guess it's a matter of perspective. You know, yes, it's a living creature you're you're destroying, but really there's there's you're not doing it for fun. You're doing it because you saw food. Uh, yeah, semi-related. But Ray, do you have any f your favorite examples of mutual aid in the animal kingdom? Uh, oh, uh, uh, th th there there are so many of them. Uh, <laughs> People are like impervious to that that idea that nature isn't anything but terrible and harsh and cruel, and so that's that's why I feel like uh, just getting your thoughts on it is uh, useful. Uh, uh, you can see a lot of videos on the internet of animals expressing grief and gratitude and mutual support and so on. Well, I watched one and I, it must have, must have been a tiger or something and a bird had fallen into a tar pit and the tiger like went over to it, grabbed onto its wing and like swung it out of the tar pit. It was uh, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I have several other examples. I mean, there's several videos on YouTube where you can see how a, a herd of buffaloes sell, saves an antelope that a lion has basically <laughs> latched on. Um, and then the, the buffaloes will go in and, and uh, kick the lion. Usually the lion leaves when he sees a herd of buffaloes, but if he doesn't, then he'll get kicked out. Um, I've also, there are several videos of uh, lions actually uh, saving um, a, like a, a newborn antelope from a hyena. Um, and, uh, you know, play, be playing with it, uh, you know, and not, not really treating it as food and just letting it be. Um, and, uh, there are actually several videos also of humans saving animals in trouble. And some of those animals are not, not, uh, uh what should I call them? Harmless at all. Um, there are videos of, of person, uh, releasing a grizzly bear from a trap, um, a very large Canadian gray wolf from a trap a bobcat, and I think even like a mountain lion. And, you know, typically if you get that close to these animals under normal circumstances, you you will probably get attacked. But it was amazing that these animals were like basically just sitting there quietly, allowing the human to free them up. 
And in some cases, after that, they refused to leave. <laughs> they just kept following the human around as if they somehow became friends. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, animals show gratitude and, and friendship. Have you seen this in birds? In one of your books, you mentioned that birds are apparently really good at, at, at trying to like get people's attention and form cooperative relationships. Uh, yeah, and you probably remember the story I, I told about the, the ants. Uh, uh, I put out uh, an ant that was drowning in, in honey, and its head was exposed. Uh, and uh, an ant uh, came along and, and uh, uh, thought it had found a, a drop of honey, but it uh, ran around it to see how big it was, and it saw the head sticking out <laughs> and jumped back in shock. Uh, and then discussed the situation for for a while, uh, <laughs> very uh, agitated communications, uh, and then I uh, went around to the side and sat down and started eating. Uh, and uh, another ant came along, did exactly the same thing, jumped back in shock, except this time uh, uh, the communication was very short, uh, and it, it went uh, around and started eating honey. Uh, and... I didn't stay there uh, to uh, see if uh, more ants came along and did the same. But when I came back an hour later, uh, the drop of honey and the ants were all gone. <laughs> oh, wow. Do you think ants communicate strictly to uh, chemical messengers, or do you think they can do um, no, like no. electromagnetic things too? Uh, they were they were obviously doing some kind of, of sign and touch language. Uh, uh, the, fr the first one... Uh, they, they would discuss it a while, and uh, the, 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 the uh, arrived ant would, would run around, uh, and they would talk about it some more, and it, it <laughs> ran around uh, two or three times uh, describing how big the drop was uh, before it started eating. So so these stories about a horse, horse whisperer or a wolf whisperer or whatnot, they actually have basis in reality. Apparently, people can learn the language of animals and communicate with them. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, I'm convinced that uh, ants, for example, have lived around people enough that, that they've learned uh, uh, in English or whatever language they're around. Uh, a couple of times uh, when uh, ants were uh, bothering a roommate who, who was going to get uh, some ant poison, uh, I uh, just... Uh, firmly and and clearly uh, <laughs> said, if you, if you don't leave, that person is going to poison you. And they just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're saying we could experience a Coco the ant like situation with sign language. Uh, w one day we could figure out the ant's language with their their arms and things like that. I, I think so. <laughs> it's obviously a, a very efficient uh, language that can take a new, totally novel situation like that and size up uh, uh, the uh, nature of the problem. Uh, and uh, uh, so the second and arriving uh, got the idea uh, in just a brief conversation. I, I interrupted you. Did, you. did the ants were, that were bothering your friend, did they just quickly go away or what happened? Yep, yep just disappeared. <laughs> Uh, great stuff. You know, you know, I have one more question. Uh, you, you called like mushrooms an inspiration based on their structure and what they're able to do. Or what are what are so special about ants? Like, what? Wh why are they so amazing to you? Uh, that at a relatively low uh, body temperature, uh, they can be uh, so quick witted. Mm -hmm. uh, as they get very cold, then they slow down. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, they they think and calculate. Uh, just uh, with amazing efficiency, uh, basically as smart as, uh, as anyone. Do you think them living in those burrows, basically, just, just like the naked mole rat, they're exposed to high concentrations of carbon dioxide, and that may explain some of their... Can. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you seen the study showing that ants don't age? Basically, they die either from a predator or, or a trauma, basically. If something squashes them, but they don't really age. Uh, that would be the uh, outcome of living in a high CO2 environment, I think. 
Okay, we'll jump to an, another question after talking about ants for 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, Macaroni Delta says, uh, what advice can Dr. Pete give regarding the best way to treat romantic grief, i.e. a broken heart? Would a physiological or a, uh, would a f- physiolo- physiological or philosophical approach uh, to it be m- um, most effective? And I think he, he had more there, but I cut it off. Uh, uh, find a substitute or replacement. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent <laughs> that's funny because that's like what the dating community would say is like quickly find somebody new well, why do you say that uh, it works <laughs> so, so do you think the concept that's... of a soulmate is a uh, is basically just a fairy tale in other words there could be many soulmates uh, yeah <laughs> that's really funny uh, okay, there, there's, there's a philosopher, you may have heard the expression, I'm blanking on the name, was a European philosopher. He said that, um, and par- pardon if this is too stereotypical, he said that love is the illusion that one woman is more special than another. I guess it can, this can be extended to both sexes. In other words, you can fall in love many, many times and you'll be just as good if, the, if it's with the right person. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay, here's another one. Can you ask Dr. Pete to exp- expound, uh, expand on his views of ontology? He has talked about Minong previously. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the uh, ontologists have, have usually uh, been confused, uh, getting mental processes uh, confused with uh, 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 thinking about the, uh, the nature of uh, reality itself. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the idea of continuity and of, of, of interaction uh, constantly, uh, everything is impressing uh, its aspects on everything else. Uh, and uh, so the, the nature of being is constantly changing as, uh, as the world evolves. Uh, uh, the substance I- itself uh, is is changing uh, uh, in in the ontological sense, the, the same way a cell uh, changes uh, with experience. And that's related to w- w- um, uh, William James's radical empiricism, right? Same thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. So, speaking of him, uh, did you know that he had, like he had a concept about stress called a reservoirs of power? Did you ever do you ever read about that? Nope. Like I, I was reading a book and it was talking about Hans Selye, and then it mentioned Cannon, and it talked about like early concepts of stress, and then it, meant, it mentioned William James, like, and I was like, what the heck? I thought he was a, a, philo- a f- philosophical person. And then I found a few mentions of uh, something called reservoirs of, of power, and he was basically talking about. How if you, um, he was basically talking about what I interpreted to be like an extreme stress state, bringing on like another level of accomplishment. But it was just interesting because he's clearly talking about, um, okay, here's the actual quote. William James suggested that every person, there are reservoirs of power, which are not ordinarily called upon, but which are nevertheless ready to, uh, to bring forth streams of energy only, uh, only if the occasion presents itself. I don't know. Th- you're familiar with those earlier concepts of of stress. Were there any that's uh, any that were interesting to you? Uh, no, not especially. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll jump to another question here. Uh, thank you guys so much for hanging out with us for Friday, Ray. I won't keep you too long. I'll let you go uh, very very soon. Thank you so much for hanging out. Thank you to Georgie for making this possible. Um, I have a question about the, this, this reserves of power. Uh, there are well documented cases uh, where mothers are basically capable of lifting cars just to save a child that's being pinned underneath. Uh, and, and under normal circumstances, they're not known to come anywhere near close to that level of, of, of being able to, to uh, muster up so much power. So, I mean, do you, do you have an idea what may be behind this mechanism? What could be causing the Southern and, and clearly unnatural, or at least not naturally present, not normally present uh, amount of muscle contraction force that these women can muster up? Is it some kind of a steroid uh, reaction? A, a very good coordination uh, of the chemistry and the nervous innervation, uh, I think, uh, uh, strengthens uh, the fascia uh, and muscles uh, in uh, a physical way that makes the, the parts stronger 
to to meet the needs at the moment. So what what would the uh, I mean clearly since these women are are, are not e being able to uh, muster up those powers on demand, uh, it's only under extreme circumstances. Um, is there any way this can be trained in a person? In other words, to be to sort of like improve the 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 condition, the physiology, to get closer to that clearly higher potential that we have. Yeah, I, I think it involves things like getting up your um, pregnenolone basic level uh, and DHEA uh, uh, that strengthen the substance at all levels. Great stuff. Ray, I'll only ask you two more questions and I'll let you go. So this one's from uh, Christian. Uh, wondering if you could recommend a safe and prothyroid way of oil painting. Maybe what substances and habits to avoid when painting. Also, maybe uh, if he could talk about his own personal painting practice. Um, I, I try not to use my fingers too much, but I'm always tempted to uh, smear the paint with my fingers. Uh, that, that's not a good idea generally. Uh, and to have a very good uh, ventilation is the, the other essential thing. Great stuff. And then we'll kind of end it here. Uh, could Ray describe what a typical day of eating looks like for him? Uh, uh, very uh, uh, random in a sense because I, I got tired of doing it one way and and, and so innovate constantly. Uh, uh, the, the common themes uh, though are uh, milk, orange juice, eggs, uh, cheeses, uh, 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 occasional cheese tacos, uh, uh, various uh, soups and so on. And, and orange juice seems to be one of those difficult things to find. You know, are you, are you using orange juice concentrate right now or, or do you have a good source of oranges? Uh, uh, no, a uh, uh, bottled pasteurized orange juice. Oh, interesting. And do you have a, a brand that, because I know a lot of people, I get that question all the time and I, and I haven't been in the U S for a long time and I'm not sure what's good or not. Uh, 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 no, it was just trial and error. I don't remember the brand. Awesome. We'll do uh, one more advertisement here. The newsletter, Ray Pete's newsletter that we were talking about earlier is $28. You can send that to Ray Pete's newsletter at gmail.com. You can order Ray's books by sending that email. Um, a name of the book and, and they'll send a digital copy to you. And then you can order pro from Kenogen, uh, email Catherine who's very nice and send it out very quickly in a package that, uh, provides protection for wh while the progesterone is traveling. And, um, that is, that is it. Any f final words here, Ray, that, uh, you know, the world, the world is going crazy and th things are hard to deal with right now. Is there any piece of advice you could give to anybody to, to maintain? Uh, uh, keep keep learning about the virus. It's currently the the most important thing uh, about the the reasons uh, uh, for for the great dangers of the vaccines. And then Georgie, you you as well. Well, sir. last last question really for you. <laughs> Do you think that the powers that be are winning? I mean, I I can see it going both ways because uh, this whole this whole technocratic nightmare that they're trying to impose depends on, on uh, turning the entire population depending on the state. But the United States is not really, the empire is not really in a, pos in a financial position right now to sort of endlessly pay people to do nothing and become dependent simply because it's it's in such a massive amounts of debt. This fiat currency thing yeah. and the printing, they cannot go on forever because it, it will essentially destroy the dollar as the reserve currency and then the dream of the new world order people is going gonna, is gonna to go down the drain too. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it, the people getting conscious uh, is the, the essential thing, and it has to uh, advance uh, at a faster rate uh, to, to prevent uh, the death of the whole system. Great stuff. Georgie Dinkov, thank you so much. Ray Pete, uh, it's an honor. Thank you so much for hanging out and continuously hanging out with us and, and you know talking it's, it's so fun guys thank you so much okay, thank you so much for listening guys have an amazing weekend uh uh guys thank you have a, a safe weekend i'll talk to you guys soon okay bye everybody